The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the RLS Foundation's webinar titled R Iron and RLS. My name is Carla Dzienkowski, and I am the Executive Director of the RLS Foundation. Before we begin, please be aware that all attendees will remain on mute during this hour. We thank you for the questions submitted with your registration. Dr. Early will answer as many questions as time allows at the conclusion of his presentation. After the webinar, you will receive an email with a link to the webinar recording. The webinar recording will also be made available in the member portal of our website. If you are not a Foundation member and if you would like to view this and other recorded webinars, we invite you to become a member today by going to rls.org. As always, individuals suspecting that they may have RLS or are experiencing a change in their symptoms should always consult a qualified healthcare provider before making a change in their current treatment plan. Information offered in this webinar is for informational purposes and should not be considered as a substitute for the advice of a physician. Visit our website to find an RLS healthcare provider near you. Our speaker today is Dr. Christopher Early. He is a professor of neurology at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine where he is co-director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Restless Legs, a certified RLS quality care center. Dr. Early is board certified in internal medicine, neurology, and sleep medicine. His research interests include RLS and sleep medicine, specifically the pathophysiology of RLS and revealing the various uh, values uh, to treatment. He is chair of the RLS Foundation's Scientific and Medical Advisory Board and an active member of the Foundation's Research Grant Committee. Uh, Dr. Early, we thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us, and I, I invite you to begin your presentation. Um, thank you, Carla. Over the next 40, 45 minutes, I will try to go through in a reasonable uh, understandable manner what we uh, understand as the underlying problem with iron metabolism in restless leg uh, syndrome. I would like to start with the first uh, physician who actually made uh, an important finding. Um, Professor Norlander in 1953 uh, reported on the value of giving IV iron therapy in patients who had restless leg syndrome symptoms and had the iron deficiency anemia. The reason for giving the iron treatment was to treat the anemia. Uh, the uh, surprise that he uh, found was that it also treated the restless leg syndrome symptoms. He went on to try giving IV iron in patients with just RLS symptoms, that is they didn't have an anemia and also found a quite marked improvement in the symptoms themselves Valves. So essentially, he was the first to bring to the fore the idea that um, iron and Russ's legs were somehow connected. However, it was Ekbom in 1960, um, and in his, in his paper, he cited Norlander's work, demonstrating in his clinic that there appeared to be an increase in prevalence of iron deficiency in the RLS population, greater than that which would had been seen, seen in a normal population. O'Keefe in Ireland in 1992 and subsequent work demonstrated that there was some relationship between your iron levels and your RLS severity. Low iron levels as demonstrated by low serum ferritin levels was associated with an increased RLS severity. His population of patients for that study had a ferritin level ranging between four and 50 micrograms per liter. This 50 micrograms per liter, unfortunately, got written into law in, in that it has ever been cited as the basis for considering giving oral, oral iron therapy. That is, if your ferritin was less than 50 micrograms, you should receive iron therapy. The problem is that that folklore failed to appreciate the study that followed it, which was Sun's study in 1997, which looked at a broad range of patients with restless leg syndrome and 
broad range of ferritins. In their population, they had ferritins ranging between five and 250 and still found that association with decreasing relative lower levels of iron associated with increased severity of symptoms, also a decrease in sleep efficiency. And so had this paper been the first to be found, we might have thought about treating RLS, in, uh, RLS patients with ferritins less than 200 or 250, but we didn't. The end result of this information is that lower iron stores appear to be associated with the risk of, of having more severe RLS symptoms and having a decrease in sleep quality or quantity. The question that arises from that is that iron, may be, iron stores may be associate, associated with the disease, but it is, actually, is it actually causing the disease? In a study by Dr. Allen, myself, and Dr. Auerbach, the hematologist, we looked at a single hematology clinic uh, run by Dr. Uh, Auerbach, who's a hematologist. Uh, we looked uh, at all patients coming to his clinic who had iron deficiency anemia over a one-year period, and we, they all received the Cambridge Hopkins RLS diagnostic questionnaire, so we could accurately diagnose the presence or absence of restless legs in this population. What we found was that out of the 250 patients that he had seen, 31 to 32 percent of those patients had clearly had clear and distinct RLS symptoms. More importantly, 24 percent of that population were considered RLS sufferers. By definition, a patient who suffers with RLS has symptoms two or more nights per week and has uh, designates that they have problems with sleep or other, other factors during the day. If we compare that to the general population risk, which is 5% of RLS patients, or to the general population with RLS sufferers, 3%, you can see that the prevalence of RLS or RLS sufferers in an anemic population is six times higher than that in the general population. Not shown here is the data where we followed up these patients after they received treatment, IV iron treatment for their anemia and iron deficiency, where there was a dramatic improvement in the symptoms and thus a reduction in the prevalence of the symptom. Therefore, there was clearly a relationship between having a low iron, not just a relationship, but a causal relationship between low iron levels and RLS symptoms. We go back to Norlander's original findings that treating non-anemic RLS patients with IV iron produced a positive effect. He postulated, it is possible that there can exist an iron deficiency in tissues in spite of the normal serum iron level. And one of those areas at that time considered possibly related to RLS was muscle, because ECBOM was, had the postulation that it was due to uh, blood vessels in the, in the legs, and therefore um, Norlander thought it might be due to low iron in the muscles. But 15 to 20 years ago, we, we our group, myself, decided to look at the brain to see if, in fact, could the brain be the source of the low iron level despite having normal serum iron values. So we're going to look at uh, iron regulation in the brain as it relates to restless leg syndrome. In this slide, there is um, serum iron levels on the far left, serum transferrin level on the far right, and in the middle is your serum ferritin level. Each one of those circles so one of those circles represents an individual patient. And you can see that the patients with RLS have uh, serum fer ferritin levels similar to that of the controls, slightly higher. So you could say that the RLS patients actually have slightly higher levels of iron than the normal, but only slight, but essentially essentially the normal uh, compared uh, normal levels uh, for both RLS and, and, and controls. Now, what you have here is cerebral spinal fluid. So um, people get a spinal tap, we take off fluid, and we look at iron levels, ferritin levels, and transferrin. Uh, 
if you look at the middle values, which are the serum or the CSF ferritin levels, you can see that the RLS patients have a dramatically lower level of serum ferritin compared to the normals. They also have a very high raised transferrin levels. So this study was the first to demonstrate that despite having normal blood levels of iron, that the brain levels of iron appear to be insufficient in some way. Since that time, there's been four other studies. So a total of five studies have looked at cerebral spinal fluid. The overall conclusions are the findings are consistent with the central nervous system iron insufficiency. So the next level of investigation is brain autopsy tissues. Uh, and this was, I would point out, the uh, autopsy material was gotten uh, from the Harvard Brain Bank uh, uh, and the R uh, RLS um, uh, brains that were, donate that were um, donated by patients and stored there. Uh, and that was um, supported by the RLS Foundation. If you look at the slide on your, on your far left, um, it looks like a bunch of blots and dots, very blue and purple. Um, and there's this big arrow pointing to this brown thing. This brown thing is inside a neuro. Outside that is the space between the neurons. All those little dots and blots in there indicates that those are individual groups of H ferritin. So this tissue is stained for ferritin levels. And so a, you can see a lot of appropriate staining. If you go over to the slide on the far right, which is from an RLS patient, you can see the brown pigment, which indicates this is a neuron, and the space between them, you see almost none, in fact, none to be exact, staining in these cells or in between the cells. Again, demonstrating that in actual tissues, from the brain of patients in this area of the brain, there appears to be a low or inadequate levels of iron in the brain. There's been five studies reported on using the autopsy tissues. They've investigated several areas of the brain, including the substantia nigra and the butamen. They've also looked at the blood vessels in the brain. They've also looked at the special organ cord they called the choroid plexus, and they've also looked at what's called the white matter, not where the neurons are, but where the axons are of, 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 the, of, the, of the neurons. And in all those tissues, you see some modifications in iron regulation. So it's not just in individual cells. It may actually be more diffuse than that. But the overall conclusion is RLS is associated with altered central nervous system iron homeostasis or iron regulation which leads to an apparent decrease or inadequate level of iron in various parts of the brain. Another way of looking at iron in the brain is using MRI, magnetic resonant imaging, because it is a magnet and because iron specifically creates um, magnetic fields when placed, disturbs magnetic fields when placed in a uh, MRI, you can use special te techniques to evaluate or semi-quantitate iron in the brain. Um, if you look at the far right picture, um, um, the uh, bright areas are related to how much iron is in the brain. So you see these areas here of the substantia nigra, and then the center pieces are called the red nucleus, both areas which are normally very iron rich under normal conditions. If you go to the slide on the left, you can see in an RLS patients, very little, some mild, you see some mild changes, a little bit here, a little bit there. So you can see some mild changes, but you can, you see the mark reduction in iron levels in patients with restless legs compared to the normal population. Again, there's been eight studies in total which have used MRI to evaluate iron levels in RLS patients. Um, there's been multiple regions looked at throughout the brain. And the overall conclusion is that the findings support the concept of a relative decrease in brain iron with decreases in the, in the substantia nigra being the most consistent. So we've looked at various different methods, spinal fluids, 
autopsy material, MRIs, to look at what um, iron regulation is happening in the brain of patients with RLS compared to controls. One of the question or one of the questions that arises is whether or not there are alterations in iron homeostatic regulation existing outside of the brain. And so we did this study and reported it back in 2008. These are all women. Um, the RLS women and control women had blood work done. And that blood work as far as their hemoglobin, as far as their iron, ferritin, TIBC, percent saturations were equal. They all had the same levels, all same hemoglobin, same ferritins. So from a serum iron point of view, they looked identical. There was no difference between RLS and controls. From that blood, we took out white cells. Specifically, we took out the lymphocytes. And then we looked at the iron regulation in those lymphocytes. And lymphocytes, a living, a living tissue, a living cell, it has, it needs to regulate iron like every other cell in your body. What we found is that in RLS patients, that these, um, pop, this population of women had a significant alterations in, in um, iron regulatory proteins, transferrin, DMT1, which is again a importer of iron into the cell, and then fer ferroportin, which is an exporter of iron. And so essentially what you see is not only do we see changes in the brain, but the tissues outside the brain also are showing alterations in iron regulation in patients with restless leg syndrome. Another indication that there are some peripheral related issues of iron regulation in RLS patients and connecting it to some of the genetic findings is the work done by Stephenson in the Icelandic population. They reported in the New England Journal of Medicine the finding of a abnormal uh, nucleotide in the gene, and the gene is called BTBD9. I won't go into details of what it is. It's, it's, it's an important gene, and there was a small little nucleotide change, and that nucleotide change was associated with a greater risk of developing restless leg syndrome. What they looked at is does this does this gene and the um, abnormality relate to any other factor. And they found a strong relationship of this gene abnormality to your serum ferritin levels. And so if you look at the two slides, one, the one on the left is from men, the one on the right is from women. So in both slides, the column on the right, at the very bottom, it says GG. That's the normal allelic variance. And you see that that's when the ferritin levels are at their highest. If you go to the column, each one of those pictures on the left at the bottom, it says AA. That's the variant. That is, in this variant, the AA variant in this gene is when you have the highest risk of developing restless legs. You also have the highest risk of having low ferritin levels, indicating potentially low iron stores and thus indicating that this gene may be relevant to controlling or modifying or affecting how we regulate iron in the cells of our body. And the difference may be not in the gene, but in how important that iron regulation is for a given cell. And so your lymphocytes may have the problem, but it, it doesn't turn into any problems with your lymphocytes. You may have alterations in your brain, like your the neurons in your substantia nigra, but because that cell is so energy demanding, uh, even low levels of iron may lead to a dysfunction. But again, it, it shows that the alterations in iron homeostasis in RLS is a little more than simply saying it's in the brain. It's probably, uh, it probably has effects on, on many of the tissues in the body. And this gene may play a role in that process. Take home message, iron deficiency conditions like iron deficiency anemia and pregnancy are a major environmental trigger for restless leg syndrome. Restless leg syndrome is associated with altered iron homeostasis, iron homeostasis involving brain, blood vessels, lymphocytes, and probably other tissues. 
there is a disconnect between your serum determined levels of iron and your brain cellular levels of iron in many patients with Russell's Lake syndrome. That is, knowing that your serum iron levels or ferritin levels are normal does not tell you much, if anything, about what's happening in your brain. Cellular iron insufficiency in the substantia nigra, which is in the brain, has been the most consistent finding and at least represents a viable surrogate for altered iron homeostasis in RLS. By that I mean, even though it is the most consistent finding, it may not be the primary area. There are many areas of the brain which have collections of dopaminergic neurons. This happens to be, the substantia nigra happens to be the primary grouping of neurons in the brain that produces the major source of dopamine, but there are many others. And, and so there could be other regions of the brain with smaller groups of dopaminergic neurons that are affected by altered iron. We just can't see it because the MRI doesn't have the sensitivity. So we tend to use the substantia nigra as our best guide to understanding iron regulation, or iron altered uh, regulation in, in the brain and patients with restless, restless legs. So the, so the overall issue is that maybe if we understood iron homeostatic mechanisms better, um, definitely under normal and under iron insufficient conditions, maybe we could get some better ideas of, of what's normal. And, and that using that information, going back backwards and, and trying to figure out you know, what in RLS patients is not normal, what's happening, what's changed, how is it different, and thus better to understand the pathology of RLS and thus understand how to better manage it. So I want to go through some real basic and, and hopefully um, I will be able to present it in a reasonable um, understandable manner, but I, I want to talk about basic iron biology um, so the listeners can get some idea of, of unfortunately how complicated this whole story is. So let's, let's talk about simple regulation. So when you take food, specifically meat, or if you take an iron pill, um, it goes into your gut and your gut wall absorbs it and then it goes into your bloodstream. Um, so virtually all of the iron that you are likely to get into your body has to come through the gut, not unless you give it into a vein like intravenously. But your body controls that. Your body has regulators, mostly coming from the liver, which will put a brake on absorbing iron. And when that brake is on, you can put all the iron into your gut as you, as you want, but you won't absorb it. So there's a limiting factor, and this is where the limiting factor takes place. Once the iron gets into your blood, it, most of it is transferred to your bone marrow. As much as, much as 85 to 95% of your iron that you take goes to your bone marrow. And that goes in to produce red blood cells. So if you look at all the iron in your body, 80% of it's running around in your red blood cells. And of course, it's serving one and one, uh, one purpose, red blood cell function. Is it serving muscles? Is it serving brain? It's serving those organs to the degree that those red blood cells provide you with oxygen, but the iron is in the red blood cells and isn't going anywhere else. So when those old red blood cells decide to die, they go to what's called the macrophage or your spleen. Those cells are specifically set to gobble up old red blood cells and take out the iron and then redistribute the iron. Most of that iron goes back into your blood and goes back to your bone marrow or your liver. So you can see all that iron in your body, most of it's being recirculated and very little is necessarily getting to your muscles or your kidneys or for that matter, your brain. The macrophages do have the capacity to send some of that iron off to other organs. And it does that by putting it on a, a special form of ferritin called H-ferritin. When the iron is stored on H ferritin, only cells which have the ability to pick up this receptor will take up this iron. So your bone marrow and liver won't touch this. This form of iron will go to your muscles, will go to your kidneys, and will go to your brain. In the end, 
after after giving your your body all this iron, your brain only gets 0.5 percent of the iron available. And so you can see that despite taking oral iron tablets or even intravenous iron therapy, that only a very, very small proportion of that total iron given actually ends up where you would like it to be. And that's the total brain. How much gets to specifically the substantia nigra, et cetera, is less clear. The other issue is to what degree is iron absorbed by the brain? So you have another factor. Yes, you can take iron, it gets into your blood, a certain percentage will go to the, bre to the brain, but is there some further regulation of the iron between your blood and getting into your brain? Because there is a blood-brain barrier which highly controls what comes in and out of the brain. So this study was done in primates, which have a similar iron regulatory mechanism and both peripherally and in the brain like humans. So we look on the far left column at the far upper uh, left um, quadrant, you have serum iron levels and you have it done. So you have eight in the morning, 12 noon, four o'clock, and then essentially eight o'clock. And as you can see, your serum iron levels over time are high in the morning and low uh, approximately 12 hours later. This is true in humans. Your iron levels are highest in the morning and approximately 12 hours later, they're anywhere from 30 to 50% lower. So your, your serum iron levels are lowest at night. If you look at cerebral spinal fluid taken at the same time, you can see it's almost the reverse. In the morning, your iron levels in your spinal fluid and thus in the brain are at the lowest. At night, they really jump up very high. So it looks like that the spinal fluid is looking to, that your brain is looking up to take is looking to take up iron late at night more so than it's looking to take up iron during the earlier parts of the day. If you look at the other factors in the spinal fluid, as in ferritin, you can see the same issue that late at night your ferritin levels go up high, again indicating that the brain is trying to increase storage of iron at night and that the greatest absorption from iron, probably from your blood to your brain, is going to happen in the late, later part of night, which does have some implications on when one might want to consider taking iron. Uh, most times people take it in the morning because, again, if you're dealing with iron deficiency, it doesn't really matter what time you take in it. But the point, if you're trying to take iron so a large proportion gets into the brain, you might want to consider taking it at night in order that a larger proportion of that iron actually gets to the brain. Um, I, I'm going to go through a couple of slides here um, that involve mice. And so I'm going to try to explain to you what this um, picture represents. Um, if we have two parents, both with different genes, and they have a bunch of kids. Every one of, your, of those kids are going to have a different complex set of genes. Some may have a few similar genes, but overall the complex set of genes are always going to be different. Each kid is going to be slightly genetically different than all other kids. Even if they had 100 kids, they all have some degree of differences between each other. Well, if you do the same thing with mice, I take two different parent mice, and I crossbreed them out to 100 different little kids. Each one of those kids is going to have a different set of the 26 genes. Some will share something common, some will be different, some will be completely different. Some will have only one parent gene, some will have the other parent gene, but there will be some mix between the genes. And so what um, they did is go to each one of those kids, identify the genes and, and gave them a number, what number one, number two, number three, number four, out to 100. So you can go to the breeder of these mice, and select a bunch of different strains. And they know which genes are in each one of these strains. So we selected a group of these strains, as you can see on the bottom. And so these, these set of strains represents complex genetics. Each one of these strains is a little bit different than the other. They have something in common, they have something in difference, and those commonality and differences may be big or large. If you look at the light purple bars, that's red blood cell or your hemoglobin. And you can see most of the mice don't differ much across 
the hemoglobin. It's about, you know, 42, 43, 45, or whatever across the top. Now, the dark purple represents mice that were made severely iron deficient and essentially potential for developing anemia. So the dark purple bar, you can see that the hemoglobin has dropped. It's interesting if you look at the animals, so we'll select two, we'll look at number 39 and number 40. Number 39 and 40 show that when they get enough iron, that their hemoglobins are about the same. But when you give them a severe iron deficiency a diet, strain number 39 shows a significant anemia, while strain 40 doesn't have any promise at all. Now, if you look at their tissue iron levels, there's almost no tissue iron. So they look the same as far as not having iron levels, but they're, the genes are different. They're able, the, the strain 40 are able to hold on to the iron and recycle it differently, but they don't get anemic despite them both being equally severely iron. Again, demonstrating the value of genes in controlling iron regulation. So again, as you can see, the, the strain 39 is, is anemic compared to the strain 4, which shows no indications for anemia. So now let's go to the brain. Um, this slide shows you iron in the ventral midbrain. The ventral midbrain is essentially like the substantia nigra in the human brain. It's very rich in iron. Um, if you look at the light purple ones, you can see there is actually a lot of natural variation in the amount of iron in this area when, when animals are fed normal diets. That's probably true in humans, a lot of natural variations. If you look at mice that are made iron deficient, which is the dark purple, you can see some really unique changes as you saw with the hemoglobin. So we look again at strain 39, they're not, there's not a big difference whether that strain was on the normal diet, diet or the iron deficiency diet. They're able to maintain iron in their brain despite the severe iron deficiency. Strain 40, on the other hand, has a severe drop, now nearly a 60% drop in the iron levels in their brain. Again, showing you how complex genetics con really controls um, the iron levels. Now, if we compare, two strains, strain 40 and strain 38, they demonstrate both a equal amount of iron in their brain when they under control conditions and an equal amount of drop in their iron levels when they're made iron deficient. However, when you look at their in hemoglobin, you can now see that the strain 40 shows no anemia, no indication of being anemic with the iron deficiency, though they show it being a low iron level with the in the brain. Strain 38 shows just the opposite effect with, with hemoglobin. That is, they have a low level in the brain and a, they are anemic, um, uh, and, they're, and they're anemic. So the take home message is that iron is individually regulated in all your organs. And that regulation is dependent upon the organ and the genes that are turned on and off. The genes that are used to reg regulate iron in your, for your hemoglobin or in your liver or in your muscle or in your substantia night are different genes. And they, reg they respond to an iron deficiency state differently. So we're back to the same message. Having a normal serum iron level or a normal ferritin level doesn't necessarily tell you what your brain iron levels are. Iron homeostatic mechanisms, mechanisms involve a complex set of genetic interactions that appear to be tissue or organ specific, leading to individual variability in the tissue iron concentrations. Serum iron measures of the iron status are at best a fair guide to the iron status of the bone marrow and are definitely a poor guide to the iron status of your brain. Iron, homeostat iron homeostasis is significantly influenced by circadian rhythms, as mentioned, time of day. So metabolism in the peripheral system in the morning is different than at night, and the brain is just the reverse. Circadian changes in iron homeostasis may be relevant to the timing of iron treatment, as I mentioned already, considering taking an iron tablet if you're going to have to take one in the evening rather than morning might be more relevant to how well it treats the RLS.
So let's talk about iron supplementation in oral patients. Oral iron therapy. Um, the usual one is 365 milligram, 225 milligrams of iron along with vitamin C. Uh, the study by Davis used this combination. Um, this was a randomized double blind trial that these patients either got iron or got placebo. They treated patients for 14 weeks. The ferritin level, the average ferritin level for this population was 134, which is nearly the um, middle range and thus in the moderate um, mild to moderate high level of ferritin. They found after 14 weeks of treating with oral iron, there was no difference in the oral sy symptoms. However, the ferritin didn't change, indicating the iron was really never absorbed. Again, emphasizing the unfortunate fact that at some point in time, um, your gut stops absorbing iron. So you can pour in all the iron via the iron pill that you want, but many people will not absorb it. Wang et al. in 2009 did a similar study. They treated people, however, for 12 weeks, but they enrolled patients with restless leg symptoms who had ferritins between 15 and 75. And what they found that there was a significant improvement in the oral symptoms and a significant increase in the ferritin levels, demonstrating that in those patients with ferritins of 75 or less, that they probably absorb enough iron to get it into the system. And thus, newer regulations are talking about when to use oral iron. Um, it's a reasonable consideration that if your ferritin is less than 75 micrograms per liter, that oral iron may be um, uh, reasonably effective. Once you get above about 100 micrograms per liter, of ferritin, it's likely that you absorb very little of the iron and thus oral iron either is not gonna work or may take you six months to a year to be effective. Thus, thus the value of intravenous iron. Given in a half pint or pint of fluid, these different formulations provide iron directly into your bloodstream. So they're not going through the gut where there's a restriction or block on absorption. If you give 1,000 milligrams, if you give 500 milligrams, whatever, you get that into your body. And again, unfortunately, most of it's going into your bone marrow. A small proportion will go to your brain and other organs. The first two of these iron formulations are very short acting. The last four are relatively long acting. That may be relevant to the fact that if, if you give an IV iron infusion in the morning, since the these um, Formulations are still releasing iron into your bloodstream 24, 40 hours. It might release it, uh, it late at night and during the period of time when you're sleeping when the brain may be taking up more of the iron and thus they may be more effective from a, from a point of view of treating RLS. They are all very effective in managing an anemia because it's all going to go to the ma bone marrow. The question is, what can you do to make sure a certain percentage more goes to your brain? The um, ferric carboxymaltose, or injective here is the brand name, is bolded in red because that's where most of the uh, IV iron studies have been done, which I'll talk about. So again, the type of IV iron that is being used may be relevant to, to um, how, you, how effective treating the RLS is compared to simply treating the anemia. So there's been two reported clinical trials of intravenous IV iron therapy in patients with restless leg syndrome who were not anemic. Um, there is uh, one trial in Germany which will be reported in the next six to 12 months and another study which should be reported within a year and then a fifth study which may get uh, reported in about a year and a half. So we have Two published studies and three out uh, studies still still uh, yet to be reported, um, more or less supporting similar issues. Um, so I want to talk about the Cho et al., which is the Korean study. It was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial. So half the population got iron, half the population got a placebo, just water, no iron in it. 
uh, it was a Korean population. They all had RLS symptoms and they all were um, on treatment or seeking treatment for their RLS. So they had to have a, you know, a mild, mild to moderate or greater severity of symptoms. There were 32 uh, uh, patients who received uh, 500 times two, so a total of 1,000 milligrams. It was five days separated between the treatments versus 32 who received the placebo dose. This graph shows you what's called the, inter the RLS severity score. Um, essentially, the higher the number, the more severe the symptoms. So a score of 28 indicates severe. So you can see those that ended up receiving the treatment, those versus those uh, that were placebo, which is in the blue, had similar levels of severity. They were all very severe. And then over the six-week period, with the six weeks endpoint being the primary endpoint for deciding whether the treatment worked or didn't work, it demonstrates that those that received the IV iron, which is the red one, were, had more significant improvement in symptoms than those that have received placebo. The original study done about four or five years ago with the same medication showed the same results, that those who received IV iron did better than placebo at the primary endpoint. After they were in this phase one trial of six weeks, they were all enrolled in a, a what's called a phase three trial and followed up for a period of 30 weeks. Uh, I know this slide looks a little busy, but if you look at the, the, um, the line over time out to 30 weeks, the, the green line, that's the patients that originally received the IV iron infusion. The red line are those that were not originally given the IV iron, but received just the, uh, the fluid. They were called placebo. They were allowed to receive IV iron after they've been through the first phase. So after that first phase, they, they, they also received the IV iron. And so we're following these, both those with the red and those with the green out over 30 weeks to see how they responded and did the response maintain itself. And so what you see, at least from those that originally received the um, IV iron infusion, that about 37% of them out at 30 weeks were still having a positive response. They had not returned to RLS medications and did not feel the need to have further treatment. So it looks like that the IV iron treatment has upfront acute benefits in the first six, six weeks, but also benefits that are sustainable out at least 30 or more days. There will be a German study, as I mentioned before, uh, that will report, report data on the one year benefits sustained after treatment. So the question becomes, how do we decide about who receives IV iron therapy? Since we're treating people who are not anemic. If you're anemic and have an iron deficiency, then you should have the treatment, whether it's oral or IV iron. But if you're not anemic, um, oral iron therapy would be appropriate in those with low ferritin levels, less than 50, less than 75. Um, and for the moment, the, the General consensus is if you have a serum level of less than 100, then IV iron therapy would be an appropriate treatment. Uh, I give a IV iron infusion of 1,000 milligrams and I use iron dextran. Other people use the um, injective here. There's other formulations, but generally 1,000 is given as a single or a split dose. We wait for at least six weeks after, because it appears it takes six weeks for the brain to finally get enough iron and make the necessary alterations to improve the symptoms. Now, some patients may have improvements a few days after, some may be a week after, but if you're going to have improvements, it's likely to be seen and at its maximum at week six after the infusion. Um, I repeat a iron serum iron panel at eight weeks and at 12 weeks. Now, this is to establish what your new iron levels are. So you, you come in with a certain blood level of iron. I give you an iron infusion eight to 12 weeks later. I repeat the iron panel to see what your new iron levels are. What did I achieve with that infusion? 
At that time, I establish your clinical status. Okay, you got the infusion. I have your iron levels after the infusion eight weeks. Are your symptoms better? Are they a lot better? Can we reduce the medication? So we establish the clinical outcome. And then I reassess it at 12 weeks. I repeat the iron level. I repeat your clinical status to see if you're relatively stable. See if the iron levels are relatively stable. If the patient responds to the initial iron infusion as established at the 12, six to 12 week endpoint, uh, then I will repeat the IV iron infusion if the patient's oral symptoms worsens and there is an associated drop in their iron levels so long as their ferritins are less than 300. So I don't necessarily use the less than 100 gauge anymore. That's the less than 100 is the initiation. After that, I wait for the person to find their own ferritin level. At, you know, at what level does your personal level ferritin need to be before your symptoms start? Sometimes it's sometimes it's 100. Sometimes it's 150. Sometimes it's 200. Um, again, understanding that your serum iron level is really really a crude indication of what's in your brain. I'm using your oral LS symptoms as the best guide to what your brain levels of iron are and trying to bring some association to what your serum iron levels are after I've given you the infusion. Commonly, commonly use serum indicators of iron deficiency. Okay, so hemoglobins less than 12 in women, less than 13.5 in men. The hemoglobin level is a poor indicator of your iron status because you can be severely iron deficient for years before you develop an, uh, an anemia. So you should always look at the iron results, not the hemoglobin results. Ferritin levels uh, less than 15, uh, 18 to 30. Different Europeans have a different guide. The Americans have a different guide. But approximately anywhere between 18 and if your ferritin is less than 18 to 30, then you have a high probability of having a iron deficiency. Um, the problem with the ferritin level is it can be falsely elevated if you have inflammation, if you're older age, if you have a decrease in renal function. A ferritin of 50. In a 20 year old woman is normal. The ferritin of 50 in a 75 year old woman is abnormal. Dr. O'Keefe has demonstrated in his uh, geriatric population when he does a bone marrow, which is the gold standard for understanding your iron levels, that patients with uh, elderly patients with ferritins in the hundred are often found to have a severe iron deficiency. And so, unfortunately, ferritins really become relatively useless in patients over the age of 75. Total iron binding capacity. If it's greater than 400, then there's a high probability that you have a mild to moderate iron deficiency. Again, this factor will go down with inflammation, also down with, with your renal function. It's GFR is glomerular filtration rate, which is how well your kidneys are functioning. So again, this indices is good if it's high, but it's not much value if it's low. So it has, it's great if it's, again, it's, it's a problem in the older age group. It's a problem under conditions of inflammation. For example, if you get a little cold, it may take six weeks after you get over the cold before these numbers come back to normal. Early morning fasting iron level less than 60 or 65, again, the Europeans and Americans have different standards, has a high probability of predicting you to have um, a mild to moderate iron deficiency. Um, a heavy meat meal, six ounces or more of, of chicken or beef the night before, has a, a possibility of elevating your iron levels in the morning. So I often recommend that people not only not eat or drink after midnight, but not have a heavy meat meal the night before to get the best values you can. Remember, your iron levels are highest in the morning, and then 12 hours later, they go low. So if 60 is in the abnormal range in the morning, imagine what it's like 12 hours later, uh, when maybe your brain is looking for iron. 
Percent iron saturation, less than 16 or 18% is again, indicator of having a mild to moderate iron deficiency. Um, the percent saturation is calculated by adding your uh, serum iron level and your TIBC together. So if you, if you eat something the night before, if you have a breakfast in the morning, if you're taking iron tablets before you have that blood drawn, then your serum iron level is going to be falsely elevated and your percent satura saturation will be useless. If you have a percent saturation greater than 45%, then there is the risk of having what's called a hemochromatosis, which is a genetic disorder, which patients end up having uh, a um, high level of iron. Um, and therefore often, is an indication not to give uh, intravenous iron or for that matter, oral iron. So just as an example, we have a patient, a man, 67 years of age, 20 years of restless leg symptoms who has a severe disease with an RLS severity score of 30. Uh, these are his labs. These are all early morning fasting. So his hemoglobin is 13.5. So he's just inside the normal range. His serum ferritin level is 65, so just inside the normal range. His ferritin is 65, so, you know, ferritin plus his age, close to his age, so he's sort of just inside normal. And then the TIBC is, again, just inside normal with percent saturation. So should the iron therapy be your first treatment of choice for managing this patient? Despite the values, being just inside the quote normal. That is, they're not exactly meeting the criteria we just talked about that would suggest that you have a mild or moderate iron deficiency. The point here is yes, this patient should receive iron treatment because the goal in this situation is not about whether or not your levels are low enough to suggest it might be affecting your hemoglobin or whatever. It's whether or not your irons are high enough to improve iron levels in your brain. And for the moment, at least the criteria we are using is that a ferritin less than 100 um, patients should be considered for, for iron treatment, whether oral or, or IV iron, and his ferritin was only 65. Uh, I guess we're open for some questions and I'll try to provide the answers. Thank you. Um. Thank you, Dr. Early. We'll start with our first question. My doctor said my iron stores are low, but I'm not anemic. What's the difference? Well, hopefully the take home, the answer to that is obvious to you all or else I've, I've not communicated appropriately. Um, you can have a severe iron deficiency and not be anemic. And so doctors look at your hemoglobin. They rarely look at your iron levels unless you are anemic. Because if you're anemic, then he's going to do your iron levels and decide whether the anemia is or isn't due to an iron deficiency. The point here is RLS is about iron deficiency, not about whether you're anemic or not anemic. So they need to be looking at your iron levels. And it doesn't make a difference whether you're anemic or not. Other than the fact if you're anemic, he's going to treat you with iron. But they'll tend to say, well, you're not anemic, therefore we should be treating you. That's not the answer. We're not here to treat anemia. We're not here to treat the iron in your bone marrow. We're not here to treat the iron in your liver. We're here to treat the iron in your brain. Okay. Next question. I have factor uh, 11 deficiency, which is hemophilia, and wonder if this makes maintaining uh, high enough iron levels more difficult. Yes. I mean, uh, hemophiliacs often have bleeding risks, and the degree to which you do have excess of bleeding is obviously going to increase your risk of having loss of blood and if you lose blood you lose iron remember all remember the large proportion of iron in your body is in your red blood cells so if you bleed you're losing all that iron and therefore your bone marrow is going to look other ways to get more iron either it's in the bone marrow if it's not in the bone marrow it's going to take the iron out of your kidneys it's going to take the iron out of your muscles out of your liver it's going to suck up the iron for all the other organs in order to make sure you don't become anemic. So yes, people with any bleeding disorder at higher risk of having lower iron levels, of course, they have a higher risk of bleed. Okay. Are plant-based irons better? No. You don't absorb iron. Greeny leafies, you have a lot of iron in it. The studies have shown we are not cows. We don't break down the fibrous material. Even if you cook it, we don't get iron out of that. So 
Um, they've compared uh, meat-based iron to the equivalent amount of vegetation, vegetative iron, and essentially the patients actually continue to get more anemic and uh, those who that take those that took the vegetable compared to those who take meat so no the only source of iron of any real value value for humans is either the iron pill or or, or meat oh well, um shrimp clams oysters also have some iron in it um, but meat or liver places like that are, are the, the primary source of absorbable iron for humans Okay, next one. Um, roughly, what percent of primary RLS is not related to iron or iron deficiency? Well, that's uh, a problem. If you mean serum iron levels versus brain iron levels, um, so you say iron deficiency, but I think about iron deficiency being brain iron deficiency when I talk about RLS. Um, but I assume what that a person means is blood levels of iron. Um, um, I think um ECBOM's numbers of about 15 to 20 percent is probably close to what you're going to see in the normal population of having um mild iron deficiency but again you're stuck with measuring um uh, the iron status of even the bone marrow with blood levels of iron and ferritin which are, are again a good but they, they are not even a great guide uh, to understanding what what the levels of iron are in the bone marrow, let alone in the brain. So it's, I'd say about 15, 20% of patients with RLS probably have some mild degree of iron deficiency, but it tells you nothing about what's happening to the brain. Okay. Um, I am 42 and have had RLS for 15 years and just learned my ferritin level is low. Should I have my kids tested and at what age? Um, unless your kids have uh, RLS, I don't see any reason to test them. But there's, at the current time, it is unclear to what degree pre-existing iron deficiency in childhood, for example, may be a trigger for future risk of developing RLS. Until we have that answer, it's not appropriate, I think, to simply check to see if you're iron deficient and correct it. Uh, as in a, a child, but it would be correct if, um, if uh, a child has RLS, it, like all RLS patients, their iron levels should be checked and appropriately treated if it's low. Okay. What are the pros and cons of iron infusion? Are there any safety concerns? The single biggest risk of iron infusions um, more or less associate with the older form of iron dextran is what's called a type one allergic reaction. That's the kind of reactions we associate with people when they are allergic to peanuts. So you get short of breath, your lips swell up, tongue swells up. That's called a type one allergic reaction. The newer iron formulation of iron dextran called low molecular weight iron dextran um, has a risk of approximately one per 100,000 to one per 200,000 infusions. So the risk is rare, but it's still there. At the current time, it is not clear that any of the newer iron formulations, uh, IV iron formulations, have that risk. But again, if I, I mean, I tend, generally treat with iron dextran. I do use another iron formulation for, for moxitol, um, but I always carry, uh, I always let the nurses know, the nurses do always do the appropriate procedures to ensure that uh, the patient's being observed with blood pressures, heart rate, and the necessary treatments if they were to develop a reaction are there. So the, the prednisone, the Benadryl, the epi are all there. So I, 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 I treat all IV iron infusions the same, uh, not just the iron dextrin. So it, that's the single biggest risk factor. Otherwise, the risk factors are relatively small. Are there any um, pre uh treatments that you uh, initiate with iron that people have to take like uh, do you uh, do test dosing or or any of those things what are your protocols for um, iron there's a test dose um, that I do with the iron dextran but not with any of the other uh, doses and I don't give um, prednisone or steroids prior to um, uh, treating patients I know that was part and parcel of what 
I used to do because I basically adapted my protocol from from a hematologist practice, Dr. Auerbach's practice. Um, but over time, it seemed like giving them prednisone was more of a risk than than waiting to see if there was any reaction. Um, you know, so no, I don't pre pre treat anybody. And when I use the iron dextrin, I give it a small test dose, 15 minutes before I give them the, the full infusion. All right, and the other thing is about Benadryl. I've I've encountered that. Um, yeah, we have, it, yeah, I, yeah. Part of the protocols are to give yeah. Benadryl either as a pre-med or if the mm -hmm. patient gets a little, blood pressure gets a little flushed and things like that. So there, there is a infrequent, but not, un, not all that uncommon reaction from all the IV irons that people can get a little flushed. They get a little red. The blood pressure will come mm -hmm. down a bit. That's a common reaction. That's not an allergic reaction. And what happens is then uh, the nurse or whatever will start giving them the Benadryl, then they will have a horrendous reaction. So Benadryl is nowhere on my pretreatment or, or, or um, hypersensitivity uh, protocol. It's, it should be removed from all protocols. It's, it's dangerous. Right. Um, let me flip to this other question. Um, are there any oral uh, IV I'm mean, sorry, oral iron preparations um, that are better, or is one better than the other? No, they're all about the same. The issue is that uh, you make sure that the amount of iron, remember the weight of it, like ferrous sulfate, 325 milligrams, you're measuring the iron, the sulfur, the oxygen, if you remember your chemistry. So the, the, the complex weight, I mean, the pill is 325 milligrams, but the actual amount of iron is only 65 milligrams. So you want to look at your package insert and see how, how much actual iron is in that pill. Because sometimes you get a pill that says 180 when the amount of iron is only 18 milligrams. So you want to be taking something on the order of about 65 milligrams of iron along with a bit of vitamin C. It doesn't have to be a lot, 50 to 100 milligrams if you can find it. Um, it should be taken on an empty stomach because if you take iron with food, milk, anything like that, the iron will immediately bind to the proteins and it will be will not be absorbed. Uh, you shouldn't take it with thyroid medications. So those are general uh, recommendations. So you'd want to take it at bedtime with um, some sort of vitamin C for best for optimal absorption and. Yeah, I use, that's, my, that's how I use it. If you're going to take oral iron for Russ's legs, I usually tell them to take it uh, at least two hours after, after the dinner. I take it with a little vitamin C. Um, um, so that's, that's, that's my usual treatment plan with the oral iron. All right, and then we're going to finish up with one last question, and we didn't touch upon this. Is you know, What's the relationship with, between dopamine and iron and RLS? Well, it's a little complex, but um, again, the area of the brain that has the biggest concentration of dopamine, which manufactures the dopamine, is the substantia nigra. It also is the biggest concentration of iron. Um, dopamine production is probably greater than any other neurotransmitter and consumes an immense amount of energy. Your iron is there uh, basically to produce energy. You could, iron and oxygen combust and they produce energy to produce ATP. And so when you have neurons that are highly active, you need plenty of iron stores to make sure things, you know, you don't run out. Um, so that is one connection. Um, one would imagine that to make dopamine, you need iron uh, to combine with oxygen via the tyrosine hydroxylase to convert um, tyrosine to dopamine that if I had low iron levels, I wouldn't make much dopamine. But in fact, it's just the opposite. When low, when you have low levels of iron, you actually make excess amounts of dopamine, indicating that the iron issue has something to do with something upstream from the production of dopamine. That iron may regulate other factors, which then go down to create a need to increase dopamine, which which if your iron levels are low in that area may, ha may have a secondary consequence of causing a lag in that production of, of dopamine. So it's a little complex, but that's sort of the, the general relationship between iron, dopamine, and Russell's lace. And, okay, and again, your symptoms, that akathisia, that sensory symptom is a dopamine response or a dopamine um, sensitive symptom.
All right. So last question, um, you know, as far as research, what, what areas are you um, looking at as far as iron into further causes or um, relationships with RLS? Well, at the current time, we have a grant from the NIH to look at genetic factors, specifically what's called epigenetics. Um, each gene has the capacity to produce a protein. Um, the process or mechanisms that um, are required to transcribe your gene and eventually create a protein out of it is very complex and is highly regulated. And that's what we refer to as epigenetics. All those mechanisms that are, are interacting between that gene and the final protein. And what we know is that there are environmental factors that often put little tags on your gene that may prevent it or slow it up from being productive and thus reduce the amount of protein that's made. And we are studying um, some of those different type of tags in relationship to one's ex exposure to iron deficiency. So if I took a population of patients who are iron deficient, who never develop RLS, despite being severely iron deficient, and I had a group of people that were severely iron deficient but developed RLS, what's the difference? Why do some develop RLS and others don't develop RLS under severe iron deficiency conditions? And the object here is to find what genetic tags are happening in these people that allows one group to be resistant to developing it while the other is not. The importance of epigenetics is that they are reversible or preventable. I can't change your genes. That's what you're born with. But I can potentially intercede in the mechanisms that ends up transcribing or turning those genes into proteins or not. For example, is it possible that exposure of the of the fetus during uh, development in utero, in utero to iron deficiency or infancy or early childhood iron, iron deficiency led to development of some of these tags on the genes that then eventually led to the patient developing oral symptoms. If we can find that to be true, then the issue is to go back early in life, treat women bef you know, early in their pregnancy so they don't get iron deficiency, identify kids in families who have RLS and, and, and make sure they don't become iron deficient and thus preventing, potentially preventing future development, developments of, of RLS. Sounds amazing and exciting, especially for all of us, you know, whose families are affected by it. And um, we appreciate all your work. And I thank you so much for taking time from your busy schedule to um, spend an hour with um, all of us um, and enlightening us more on RLS and iron connection. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Have a great afternoon, everyone.